Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to day two of LACNIC on the Move Belize. I'm your Master of Ceremonies, Kevon Swift. As a recap, we discussed a variety of topics yesterday. With Janine Lepensky, we saw the phases of IPv4 exhaustion, details on the IPv4 waiting list, and how to make requests for numbering resources in general. We then had an informative session with Diego Dominguez explaining peering and catching functions at Facebook and the evolution of Facebook's infrastructure over the years. Alejandro Acosta spoke about technical considerations and business cases for deploying IPv6 and extended an invitation to organizations that were indeed deploying IPv6 in Belize to participate in the IPv6 challenge which is a regional competition to document and showcase V6 success stories from around the region. Lastly, Graciela Martinez gave an overview of LACNIC's CSIRT, emphasizing its reporting function among others and highlighting a number of cyber incidents where Belize's resources may have been implicated. Today, we have a hands-on session on DNS and DNSSEC prepared by LACNIC's Carlos Martinez and Nicolas Antoniello from ICANN. This activity aims to give a brief overview of the DNS, the domain name system, explain what DNSSEC is and how it works, do a hands-on configuration of a recursive DNS server with DNSSEC validation and hyperlocal, do a hands-on configuration of an authoritative DNS server, key pair generation, and DNS zone signing. And the session will cover basic troubleshooting of DNS and DNSSEC issues. I would now like to hand you over to Nicolas and Carlos, who will lead us through today's activities. Over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for your kind introduction. Um, I hope you uh, guys enjoyed our session yesterday. And uh, today, I hope you will enjoy our DNS session uh, that we expect to be very hands-on and very dynamic and very interactive. So feel free to use the chat and Q&A to ask us questions. So uh, the idea for today is that we will have a first, I would say third of the time we have, uh, where we will go over some basic con um, concepts of DNS and DNSSEC uh, in order to prepare us for the labs that will follow. Uh, let me introduce my friend, Nicolas. Nicolas, maybe you want to say a few words while I load my PowerPoint. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, I was also testing <laughs> some of the <clears throat> some parts of the of the presentation. Yeah, as Carlos mentioned, what we are going to to go through today is first we are going to do a kind of brief and and fast uh, recap on on DNS basics and 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 DNSSEC functioning, and then we are going to do the the, the funny and most interested part, which is the the hands on. We are going to try to uh, <clears throat> configure, and you are going to configure. You are going to be to have a, a network, or basically you are going to have six uh, virtual machines for your own testing, and you're going to install from scratch uh, two resolvers, one running bind and the other running unbound. Then you're going to, uh, and you're going to configure them to, to, be, to be resolvers. And then you're going to configure, we are, we are going to, to try to configure a, an authoritative server in a in a in a way and in a in a topology we are going to to explain with Carlos later, which is the 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 the, the main authoritative server which we call SOA. It's it's hidden, so it's not public, it's not a server that, that is gonna be accessible by the by the by the public through internet. And then you're going to you're going to have two secondary servers that are going to you know copy the song from the from the from the main server. And those are going to be public servers. One, it's gonna be running bind 
as a resolver, uh, sorry, as an authoritative server, and the other one is going to run NSD as, a, as an authoritative uh, secondary also. And if time allows, after all that, we are going to do some, some, some testing for all that. And if time allows, after that, we are going to sign your zone using the NSSEC, and we are going to try to test that using a using a, a client which is also a, a a virtual machine you you will you will have but we, we'll go through that later maybe carlos we can start with the with the presentation yeah. as... so uh, as you've seen you we have an ambitious program for today let's see how how much we can cover from that uh in any case the lab will be available for a couple of days if you want to follow on your own so let's start with the intro so this is the agenda for this first part. Uh, we are going to discuss what is DNS and what role that is serve on the internet. Uh, we were going to talk a little bit about the semantic structure of the DNS. Since the DNS is basically a um, directory or a database, we need to uh, talk a little bit about the semantics of this directory. We are going to discuss uh, the different roles a DNS server may uh, fulfill, like client, recursive, and authoritative. We are going to see some query examples, and then we are going to talk a little bit about DNSSEC. So the DNS as a database. Um, the DNS is basically a directory service. Uh, this means that it's a database that has a very particular, a very particular um, way of functioning. Uh, you may be used to the concept of a database as a, as a, as you would think about a spreadsheet, like you have these columns and you have these rows and you can uh, go over all the rows. Directories are databases that are a little bit different. You query the directory for an index. There's always an index. There is nothing else. There are no rows that you can query. I cannot query for the middle, uh, the middle part of a name. And why, why is this useful? Because it's very easy to build very fast databases in this way that are very uh, efficient at doing lookups, although they may be slow at writing, but exactly what we need here in DNS is a database that is very, very efficient when you query it. Why? Because the internet is large, the internet is big, there are billions and billions of users, and we are getting billions and billions of queries. So we have to be very efficient when um, responding these queries. So um, the key or the index in this database is what we call a domain name. And a domain name is something everybody who has ever used the internet is familiar with. It's basically a set of labels separated by a dot. Let's see the example we have here. We have www.lagnik net ui we have a four level domain name and there's a fifth or a last level that is usually implicit and you are going to sell them hear about it except when you do dns um, as an administrator and you have to configure things which is the root the dns the directory has a root a common part that every domain name has and this common root as you will see, serves an extremely important role, which is it's what allows us to discover any name in the internet. Why is why it's possible for us to discover any name on the internet is because we share a common root. This directory maps basically this index, this label that what we call the domain name, into something that we call a value. The value will usually be an IP address. It can be other labels, and we are going to see some examples of that. But in the most common case, the directory, when you query the directory, you will get a value that is an IP address, either an IPv4 or an IPv6 address. Um, so semantics. When we perform a DNS query, we enter two parameters are two things that are interesting. One is the um, label itself. The other is what we call a type. The type defines 
the kind of value that we are going to get. And we are going to see some examples here. So when I use this notation here, like a parenthesis, a label plus a type, what I'm, going, what I'm saying here, and it's going to be important in the coming slides, is that I'm asking the DNS for this index or this label plus this type. So there are many types in DNS, there are like a hundred of them, but the most common, and the, I would say the 99% of cases, you are going to see some of these types here. Like so SOA, A, quadruple A, MX, NS, TXT, and uh, CNAME. Uh, SOA is the start of authority. It's something that every zone has at the beginning. A is for IPv4 addresses. Quad A is for IPv6 addresses. MX is for mail exchanges. It's how you, you publish, to how do you tell the internet that a domain has an email server and it's ready to receive email. Uh, NS is a, a very important record because it signals what happens at a, at a dot. It signals that it is a, what we call a delegation. There is another server that is going to answer for the for the remaining of the of the label. TXT it's simply a text a text label. It's a text value that we can use for doc documented zones or other things within the DNS. And CNAME, which is uh, an aliasing function, uh, you, you, we can say using CNAME that two labels are equivalent. So a couple of examples. Uh, this first query is a question for the DNS regarding the label www.lagnet.net for type A. And the answer is, if you can try it on your own machines, will be 200.3.14.24, uh, which is an IPv4 address. And another example, for example, is uh, you can query the DNS uh, for the domain name ICANN.org and for type MX, which is something that any mail server will do if you, for example, send an email to Nicolas. And the answer to this is something called pecora1.icon.org. See that the, that the answer here, it's another domain name. And eventually the server, we have to do a second query in some cases to get the actual address of this label. Um, in some cases, and this is a very useful feature of the DNS, this uh, index correspondence, this mapping can be a one to many correspondence, which means that you can query the um, DNS, for example, who is that lagging the net type A, and you will, get, you will get two addresses, not one. What does this mean for a computer trying to connect to who is? It means that it should try the first address and if it fails, it should try or go over to the second, which is a, a useful feature uh, to provide simple redundancy, a simple a low low balance for some services on there. So, how is this directory structured? I mentioned already the common root, although my my head is kind of you know, making it hard to read here. Yeah, the, the example we are going to use uh, mentions lagnic.net.uy. So uh, this inverted tree, inverted trees are very popular with computer scientists because they have very useful properties. Uh, it's an inverted tree which has a root. Every inverted tree has a root and we in the internet share <clears throat> the common root. But our information, our zones, are somewhere here in these little bubble, bubbles around. So what does this NS mean here? It means that there is a delegation, it means that there is another level in the tree. This is the, the meaning of the NS record. So if you, um, if you ask the root for .ui, you will get an NS record that points to the next level. And if you query the .ui servers for dot net dot ui you will get that a second answer uh, and so on and so forth basically we can query the dns for the subsequent delegation points and then we can in this way discover every single name on the internet the green the green posted here mentions that the dot on a label is a clue that that they may be, there may be a delegation it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a delegation. Uh, a, a common example here, for example, is when you have the, the triple W, 
around, uh, and before this one, there is no delegation for W, although they could be, but it's not usually the case. So uh, a very confusing for those uh, DNS beginners is that um, a label is a valid character in a domain name. It doesn't necessarily mean that the domain name is, um, is a delegation or what we call a song cut. There may or may not be a song cut at all. So authoritative servers. Um, now we're going to discuss a little bit about the um, different uh, roles a DNS may have, a DNS server may have. So we are going to start with the authoritative kind of server. So authoritative servers, it's, it's sometimes a, a concept that is very intuitive, but hard to explain in words. So I, I chose these words that is the authoritative server is the one that holds the truth. It's the one who actually knows what is true and what is not. So um, the um, authoritative server will say things like this. Let's say we are going to ask uh, this server, which is called ns2.lagnic.net for this uh, DNS question. Hello, ns2.lagnic.net. Can you answer me for www.lagnic.net quad A? Remember that we always need to specify the type here, right? So the answer for the server, since ns2.lagnic.net is what we call authoritative, for the domain name lagnin.net, it will happily answer back the um, 2001, um, whatever, you can read the APV6 salary yourself. Why? It says, I have it on my hard drive because I'm authoritative for it. I have the actual information for, um, the, uh, for this uh, domain name. This is what I, being authoritative means. I don't need to ask anyone else about that. And it's not something that I learned from others. It's something that I know, I know for a fact. How, do, how does the server know? Because some, some operators have configured the zone in it, right? Next. So the authoritative will be authoritative, authoritative for some parts of the namespace of the internet, some zones we call them. And we have a, here an example what happens oh, when you ask an authoritative server for something that it cannot possibly know. Imagine that we ask ns2.lightning.net for a name and a type, a name that has a google.com in it. And this server cannot possibly know anything about Google. So it will ask with an, it will return an error status called refused because it's something that it cannot answer because it doesn't no, it, it is not authoritative for a domain, google.com. So the actual question to the Panda is that I don't have permission to make that query for you. This means that is in some cases, some servers will have permission to do that. And that will take us to what we call recursive servers. So recursion, recursive servers. This brings us to the, pro the problem of how do I discover names on the internet, names that I don't know. So remember that they mentioned that we have a common root. The common root is key here because it's the domain name that every single server in the internet knows where to find. How do they know where to find it? Because they are configured to find it. The name servers for the root zone are we call, what we call root servers. And the root servers have IP addresses that are well known and are configured in a text file in most uh, DNS servers. So every server, when it boots, it knows how to query the root. And every single query that it doesn't know the answer uh, because it's authoritative for it, it will go through this process we call recursion. So, Recursion is very simple, actually. It will repeatedly ask every server along a chain of delegations for the same thing, beginning with the root. So imagine that we want to discover quad a www.lagnic.net. 
So I don't know anything about lagni.net. I will ask the root. It's the only thing I can, I, I, I know how to do is to query the root. If I never ask for a name that ends with lagni.net before, the only thing I can do is ask the root. So the root doesn't know anything about lagni.net either, but it knows about .NET because it knows there is a delegation in the root for .NET. So the answer here will be the DNS servers for .NET. What the, uh, is going, the client going to do? It's going to ask the servers for .NET for the same thing. And the same thing is going to happen. The .NET servers, they don't know anything about Lightning.NET. The only thing they know is that there is a delegation for Lightning.NET here. And eventually this will reach the servers for Lightning.NET, which are which will finally respond to this query because they are authoritative and that's the end of the process. This is a simplified, or, or I would say the most explicit version of recursion because it asks the same questions repeatedly to every, to every level in the, in, the, in the DNS tree. Although there are shortened versions of it because there is something called the additional section in DNS responses, which helps uh, I would say helps this uh, shorten this uh, this um, recursion uh, chain in order to make it faster. Actually, so that's one. So uh, recursive queries. This was supposed to be a video, but something happened to it. Uh, but let me know. Let me see if I can share a terminal window and show how to perform recursion. So I'm going to. I hope you can see my terminal window. Can you confirm that you're seeing my terminal window? Hey, Nico, can you see my terminal? Yes. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, perfect. I'm going to enlarge the font and I'm going to do a very simple example of a manual recursion. I'm going to, I, I'm going to try to resolve the same thing that I showed in the slides, which if you remember, it was, finding www.lagnic.net type quad A. So uh, I don't, don't know anything about Lagnic.net, so I'm going to ask the root. I'm going to pick any root server, let's say k.rootservers.net, lagnic.net quad A. And we are going to use a couple of switches for this to simplify the output because otherwise it was going to, it's going to be a very difficult to read. So it's no answer. Sorry. No call plus answer. It's authority. So this plus those plus flags are not DNS specific. There are instructions to this tool that is called D. Uh, this is a tool that we are going to use during the lab afterwards. So it goes. Um, here the root is telling me that the answer for my question is empty. There's no answer here, but there is something called the authority, authority section that tells me that there is a delegation for .NET, not for the whole name, but just for .NET, with points, which points to all these servers. So I'm going to repeat the question, basically picking any of these at random, let's use age. Oh, same thing happened. There is no answer, but there is a delegation. Um, it says that Lightning Net should be available for any of these servers. We are going to pick one at random again. <clears throat> let's say ns4.apnic.net. And there we go. We finally reached the answer after performing three queries. Um, <coughs> this is again, a simplified version of a recursion. And you see that it's basically asking each level of the tree, the same question. So back to the slides. Thank <sighs> you. 
I'm going to discuss now two related concepts which are cash and TTL. TTL means meaning time, time to live. <clears throat> so I described how recursion works and you will know how the whole process works if you want to access a, a web page, if you want to see the Google, Google search engine, you type www.google.com in a browser and eventually the page pops up. What happens behind the curtains is that your computer will make a recursive DNS query for the name www.google.com. Uh, there will be a recursion, eventually three queries to the DNS, and then it will get an IP address to connect to, and it will show you the uh, actual web page. So this can be slow because, um, for example, in the worst case, each query could take like, a, let's say 200 milliseconds and then three queries will be 600 milliseconds, which is a very noticeable delay in a response. So uh, the whole page will feel, will feel slow. And this recursion has to be repeated for every object in the, in the page. You know, objects are these images and uh, HTML blocks and everything that builds that, that constitutes a web page. So if we were to delay the queries for each name by 600 milliseconds for each object in a web page, the whole thing will feel, will feel very, very slow and very sluggish. So enter cache and TTL. <clears throat> Since um, you, you just saw in the, demo, in the demo that I did that every single name that starts, that ends with .NET will be um, served by these servers that I call something gtld uh, uh, slash servers.net. So um, it doesn't matter which .net I want to resolve, it will um, always return the delegation to .net. So uh, this means that the next time that I want to resolve a name that is also an ending in .net, let's say, um, apinic.net, our friends from uh, Asia Pacific. I will, I, my, my server already knows about the .NET servers. Why? Because it has them cached. It remembers the answer from the last time it resolved a, like, um, a .NET server. So uh, that query actually will be very, very fast because it will be answered from memory. It will be answered from the cache. The TTL or time to live is how we make sure that the information we have in our cache is fresh. It's, it's real, it's actual. TTL is a time measured in seconds that uh, tells a server for how long to store an answer in its memory. So eventually um, I will reuse the answer for net or for com, it's the same thing. Um, until when, until the cache expires. So if we use cache times that are long, I will very seldom have to repeat the question about the method delegations. Okay, so next slide. So uh, this is basically the end of the introduction to DNS. Uh, I have covered the, the most I would say relevant or important or critical topics. And if you have to remember something, please remember these three things. A DNS record maps two things, a name and a type to a value. So we will always ask the DNS for a name and a type, and we'll get a value. Most of the time, that value will be an IP before an IP v6 address. <clears throat> that we can, uh, the browser or another application can use to connect to. Also remember that the namespace is structured as an inverted tree with a common root. And the common root is key in order for us to discover every single name on the internet. And also remember, keep in mind that a DNS server can be either recursive and or, and the, the and or part is important, can be and or authoritative. A server can be authoritative, authoritative, uh, authoritative for some zones, yet perform recursion for others. 
the authoritative server is the owner of the truth, and the recursive will um, provide a service to the clients, helping them finding real answers by doing recursion, asking every single server along the way. So I think it's on to you, Nico, now. Hi. I'm going to stop <laughs> sharing. Th okay, thanks, Carlos. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna try to, to share um, here. There you go. Mm -hmm. Let me find the... Doo -doo -doo. Here, while I find the presentation, <coughs> I, I just going, would like to 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 re remind you that in in any any case or any time you have a, a question or a comment, just please drop drop it in the Q and A or or in the in the in the chat, or just raise your hand and 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 we can maybe we can uh, turn on the mic and you can you can ask. This, this is the the idea of this is making it interactive so it's going to be more interesting and enjoyable. Uh, let me start the presentation. Okay, it's loading. All right, can you see the presentation? Carlos? Oh, sorry, yeah, perfectly. Okay, I'm going to move my, my myself <laughs> to this side of the screen. Maybe it's going to mess. A little less with the with the with the with the presentation. All right, so I'm gonna go forward because it's this is what Carlos already has gone through. Oops. Okay. That's there. It is. Okay. So we are we are going to now we are going to go uh, to do a, a kind of fast go through uh, what is the NSEC and and what's the the idea behind it. We are not going to to get to uh, too deeply into into how the the algorithms and 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 the DNSSEC protocol itself uh, works, but 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 we are going to for sure we are going to to try to remind the idea behind DNSSEC and 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 what is what is doing uh, on the authoritative side and and on the recursive side. So, what's the idea behind DNSSEC? DNSSEC, it's uh, a solution to uh, to communications through unreliable channels. Uh, we 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 may say that the original DNS protocol, uh, with the, with the original DNS protocol, the, the one that Carlos just explained, it, you don't have uh, a means to uh, to know to make sure that the answers you are getting. From suppose you are the, the resolver, you are the one that finds the information for the clients. And once you have the information, you do basically two things. You store the information locally, as Carlos mentioned, in, 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 in your memory. That's the, the cache of the resolver. And you, of course, you give the answer to the client that first asked you about, uh, for example, what's the IP uh, related to some uh, domain name. So. When you are the recursive and you are looking, you're going uh, through some of the authoritative servers starting from the root to find the, the answer. Uh, how can you make sure that the answers you are getting from the authoritative servers are the are the, the, the answers that were meant to be were meant to be by by the by the by the authority? I mean, what I, what I try to 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 say is that if someone Manage to tamper with the with the with the authoritative server you are getting the info from. You won't know. You won't notice if you have if you don't have any any additional uh, protocol like this, like DNSSEC, with the original DNS DNS specification. You don't have any means to realize that the information is the the the, the real one, or it's someone that you know just tampered with the info and you are getting the wrong info. Of course. This, that would be, uh, for example, the consequence of an of a successful attack or or whatever. And the other thing you cannot be sure you cannot make sure <clears throat> with the original DNSSEC specification is that even that even if no one tampers with the with the authoritative server, someone may stand in the middle of the of the transmission of the information and tamper and change the information while in transit. 
So the information that leaves the authoritative server is the real one, <clears throat> but the information you get is not the real one because someone changed it, changed it in the middle. That's that's kind of what we normally call <clears throat> person in the middle attack, you know. So someone stands in the middle of the communication, changes the data. So the data that reaches you is not the real one. For example, I change the IP address associated with the with the <laughs> domain name you asked for, and you end up going to a different place, not the not the original one you you were supposed to be, but a, a fake one that may look exactly the same as the original one. So you type your, for example, your bank uh, login account and your bank uh, password, and then it it can link to your real bank account and you, you do your stuff. And once you disconnect, the attacker has your username and password and can you know do anything with your account. Basically, that's kind of one example, but it's a real one. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a real one. So what does the NSEC do to kind of uh, solve or, or mitigate this, this situation we, we talked about? This is what the NSEC uh, mainly do. What the NSEC does is it uses public key, what is called public key cryptography. We are going to go through that uh, in a in a few in a few minutes. It uses public key cryptography and digital signatures to provide authentication of origin, origin authentication, and data integrity. This is origin authentication is to make sure that the data it's the the, the original one. So to make sure that no one tampered with the authoritative server. And data integrity is that the data that lives the authoritative server, it's the same data that reaches you. So no one changed the data in transit, okay? That's the two main things that the NSEC does. With this, it offers protection against DNS data spoofing. So if someone tampers or spoofs the, with the data, you will notice, you will, you will, you will, you will know it and you will as the resolver, you will know it and you will tell the client, I cannot give you this answer because basically this answer is not correct because I cannot verify the either the origin or the integrity of the data. And <clears throat> it also provides uh, a full protection against uh, cache poison attack, which is cache, what is cache poison? Cache poison is tampering, instead of tampering with information in the authoritative server, you tamper with information in the recursive server so the, the the you remember that uh, carlos told you that when you when you resolve when you are a resolver and you resolve and you get the answer to certain query you give that answer to the client of course and you also store it in a local in the local memory so if anyone else asks for the same information you will have it you are, you will already have it in memory and you don't have to you know go out and, and ask again all the authoritative servers to get the answer. So if I manage to change that information stored in the recursive servers, clients will get fake information. So the NSEC kind of solves that, that, that issue. Uh, in fact, the, this kind of attack, which is cache poison attack, it's the, the, the source or the motivation for the creation of, of the NSEC. The NSEC was mainly created because of this kind of attack uh, as a means to, to solve it, okay? So this is what the NSEC does. Uh, what does the NSEC, uh, what, what, <clears throat> what does the NSEC do not? So the NSEC does not provide confidentiality in the exchange of DNS data. This is, it's, the NSEC, it's not a privacy protocol. It won't encrypt your traffic between you or the resolver or the authoritative servers. It won't encrypt it. It won't provide this. There are other protocols, other solutions to provide, uh, to kind of provide privacy, not the NSEC. The NSEC is uh, providing more security in, in, in the way of origin authentication and data integrity. So there's no privacy with the NSEC. And of course, the NSEC won't avoid uh, denial of service attack. So if someone tries to, for example, fill up your app link, so you don't have a bandwidth, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have a, a bandwidth available to do any other stuff, the NSEC won't protect you from that. You have to, to do another mainly network, networking or more close to network solutions to, 
to try to mitigate or, 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 or avoid the, the OS attacks, not, not DNSSEC. There are other, also another protocol. So DNSSEC is just a part of the security suite, let's say, you, you should apply to your, your DNS server, but it won't solve all the problems. Okay, let's go to the next one. So we are going to try to fastly uh, explain or, or review what's uh, this uh, public <clears throat> and private key cryptography that DNSSEC uses to provide this, this, this original authentication and, and data integrity. So what, 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 we, what we have here is an example. So this is the, the, DNSSEC, the DNSSEC Panda. And what, what, what we are going to try to, to, to explain here is that we have uh, information is stored in the authoritative servers, right? Those are called registries, and, and those, those, uh, those registries have um, uh, those, sorry, those resource records. It's called resource records. The, 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 let's say the resource records are, as Carlos mentioned, are, the, the, are containers that stores information in, in, author, in the authoritative servers. For example, a resource rec the resource record that stores the IP before address that corresponds to a certain domain name, it's called the A record. The resource record that stores the IPv6 address uh, corresponding to a certain uh, domain name is called the quad A or quadruple A record and so on. There are other, other records for, for other uses like the NX record, which stores the name of the mail server for a certain domain name. Uh, and it's called, uh, there are other, other, other resource records that we, we can uh, recap in, 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 in the future, maybe. Okay, so those resource records in the original DNSX specification, when, when, when some resolver carries for any of those resource records, the authoritative server will send the, the information in, in clear text. And you don't have, as we mentioned, you don't have any means to, to, to make sure that that's the original data and that no one tampers with, tampers with it. So what the NSX is going to do is to add new records, yeah, that will provide, basically will, it will provide a signature, a digital signature that will allow the resolver to check that if the signature is okay, if, if the signature is valid, it, they, will, they will make sure that that signature is from the original uh, owner of the data and they will, they will make sure that by validating that signature that the, the original data, it's, it's, it's the original one. And also that no one tampered with, with, that, with that data. So in order, to, in order to, to do this, we are going to, uh, to re recall what, what a hash function is. A hash function is uh, a, a way of, if you have, let's, let's, let's say in, like in this example, let's say we have this, this text, yeah, the panda has all these this, uh, this text. I, I, are you able to see the, the arrow, Carlos? Or I'm just pointing the air and no one is seeing. I can't hear you. I don't see, I don't see your, ah, yeah, there it is. I can see your arrow, yeah. Yeah, you, you, can you see it? Okay, so this all this text right. is the, 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 the original data we have, okay? If we apply a hash function, yeah, what the hash function does, to this text is to kind of generate uh, a, a, a kind of uh, signature to of this of this text. The, the 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 properties of that signature, the interesting property of of that signature that 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 generates is that that signature is unique to this text. That means if I change any any character on on this text, even adding a space, yeah. If I change anything on the original text and I do the hash again, the result of the cache will be different from the previous one. So if you change the original test, you have a different cache, a different hash. So the hash is unique to the original text. And the other property that is interesting to us is that the hash has a fixed length. So no matter the size or the, the, the length of your original text, the hash length Will be always the same. Let's say we use, uh, of course, as long as you use the same hash algorithm. But if you use the same hash algorithm 
and let's say the the the, the answer ha uh, has uh, I don't know twelve characters in length. The hash the hash will be always twelve characters in length, no matter how how big or how much text it's in the original in the original uh, data. Okay, so the hash the fix the, the length of the hash sorry is fixed and the hash the string it's going to be unique to the text if you change anything in the text remember that you will have a completely different hash same length but completely different hash okay that's hash then what is public key and private key encryption so uh we normally Inco, like to yeah sorry to interrupt you <laughs> yeah uh, the, the there was a schedule uh, a break now uh should we go to the maybe break? maybe we can maybe we can end with this and and we 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 make the break before going to the lab okay it's okay just, uh, uh, some minutes some more just, minutes like five minutes so, more. okay 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 so um what is public key and private key encryption okay uh normally we talk about two kinds of encryption we can talk about what is called uh symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption is when you have a shared password or a shared uh, secret uh, string or secret key that you share with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the counterpart. I mean, with the other, with the other let's say you are uh, exchanging data with another person, you want that data to, 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 to be encrypted. So, so if, you know, so no one can tamper with the data in, in, in transit and only the, the recipient of the data will be able to, to decrypt and see the original text. So you use, if you use a shared uh, key encryption, you encrypt the original text and you have to tell the other person, this is the encryption key, this is the secret key. So the other person receives the encrypted text and uses the secret key you provided to decrypt the text and see what's in there. The, the, so the key thing here is that the encryption key and the decryption key are the same. That, that's symmetric. On the other hand, there's another kind of, of encryption which is called public and private key in this case, which uses different keys from encrypting and decrypting. You use one key to encrypt and a different key to decrypt. So one of those key is called private key. And the, the other of those key is called public key. It's just a matter of how you call them. But what you will have to, to know or to recall is that if you encrypt some kind of data with the private key, the only way to decrypt it, the only way to get again the original data is to use the, the other key, the public key. And also you can encrypt with the public key and the only one that will be able to decrypt that is the one that has the private key. So the, if you encrypt with one key, you need the other key to, to do the, the opposite, the opposite uh, to perform the opposite operation to, to get back the, the original text, okay? Why then, why it's called private and public key? Because normally the private key, it's only known by you. You won't give anyone else your private key. You're going to keep the private key for yourself in a secret place, maybe in your mind, or maybe in, in, in some, some secure box, either digital or physical box, okay? So you keep your private key for you. So you are the only one that will going to use your private key to encrypt data, okay? And then you can give the public key to all the people that wants to be able to see your data and you and you, you you may ask okay but if you are giving the public key to all the the world to all the public then anyone is going to be able to decrypt your data so where's the secret there because if i can encrypt but anyone can decrypt it there's no security yeah but that's the the magic or that's the 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 the, the functioning behind what we call you know, digital signatures. Of course, if I give the public key to anyone, anyone can see the data, but then anyone will be able to make sure that the data is the original one. It's the data I was meant to send to them. Why? Because if you have the public key, 
you can decrypt the data, okay? But if you can decrypt the data with a public key, that means that only the one that has the private key was the one that was able to encrypt it. And as I assign the only one that has the private key, anyone that gets the data by using the public key and being able to decrypt it will make sure that that's the data I originally sent and that no one's, no one was able to tamper with the data because no one has the private key. So if someone manages to get the original data and tries to, you know, to modify something and, 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 and give you a fake uh, original signed data, it won't be able to do that because as it doesn't has the, as it doesn't have the, the, the public key, even if this person uh, manages to, to tamper with the data, it won't be able to encrypt it again because it doesn't have the, the private key, only, only me, only I have the, the, the public key, okay? So what's, uh, in summary, what's, what's uh, normally called a digital signature in, 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 and, and mainly in the scope of, of DNSSEC, the digital signature will be a combination of hashing and signing with a, with a private key. What we are going to do is we will have original data. That will be the, the, the resource records we are going to send to the resolver from the authoritative servers. So before sending that, the authoritative server is going to perform as uh, the signature of that record, okay? First, it's gonna take the data in the record and it's going to apply the hash. So it's no matter how long or how, how, how much information is the original record, by applying the hash, you will get a unique string, a unique fixed length string, right? This is the, this, this, string, this string in this example, this is the original resource record, which contains any data. For example, the IP corresponding to a, to a domain name. You apply the hash and you get the, the signature of that, of, that, uh, of that resource record. This signature is fixed in length, but it's unique string for that record. Then you sign it with your private key. You encrypt it with your private key. So you encrypt the hash. You do not encrypt the original text. You encrypt the hash. So if you encrypt the hash, you get the digital signature. Okay, you encrypt it with your private key. And then you send that to the, to the, you send that to the, to the resolver. The resolver will get that information and will perform the opposite, uh, the opposite uh, operation. What does the resolver needs to perform the, the opposite operation, which is to verify the digital signature? It needs basically three things. It needs, of course, the original data. So we are going to send the original data in clear text. It doesn't matter, as Carlos explained it, you send the, the answer for the query, but you will also send the, the, the digital signature. So you, you remember that we, in the, in the authoritative server, we do the hash and then we encrypt with the private key. This is the signature. We send the signature. We send, we send this signature along with the, with the original data, with the original data. We send this and we send this, okay? And we will also have to send it or to tell which algorithm are we using for, uh, for, for, for encryption. And we also have to tell the public key. So we are also sending the, the, to the resolver, which is our public key, okay? So the resolver will get the original data, it will get the signature and it will get the public key, okay? If you have those three things, what can you do? Okay, you, you, you have the, 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 the digital signature and you have the public key. If you apply the public key to the digital signature, you can decrypt the signature, okay? And if you decrypt the signature, you, you are here, you apply the public key, not the private, the public key, and you go this way, you, you go the way around. So you get, you get from, the, the, from applying the public key to the digital signature, you will get the hash. Now you have the hash, okay? And you know what algorithm was used originally by the authoritative to make the hash. So you have the hash and you also have the original text. Remember that we also send the original text. So you can apply the same hash function to the original text. You apply that hash function and you compare 
the two hashes, the one you obtain by, by making the hash of the original text and the one you obtain by decrypting the signature. If those hash matches, then you can make sure that that's the original info. If someone tampered with the info or the info is fake, those hashes won't match. And that way you will be able to verify the signature and confirm or make sure that the, the, the resource record you are getting, the information you are getting in those in that resource record is the original one and no one is, and, and it's not a fake one, okay? So that this is the, like the summary of, of, of all the process. You are in the, in, the, in the authoritative server, make the hash, sign the hash with your private key, send all that information to the resolver, the resolver gets the information, gets the public key and gets the signature, decrypts the signature with the public key and gets the hash and also makes the hash of the original text, compares those two hashes and voila. If the hashes matches, it's okay, it's validated, the, the data, it's the original one and no one tampered with it, okay? Very fast, these are the mainly the, the three uh, resource records, new resource records that the DNS security extension adds to the original DNS specification. It has a, a resource record called RRC, which information is stored in this resource record? In this resource record, it's stored the signet resource record. So you got the resource records in the authoritative servers. You remember that you we generate the, the, the digital signature and we store that digital signature in this resource record. And this is the resource record we are sending to the resolver with the containing the, the digital signature. The DNS key resource record is the one that will contain the public key. We have to send the public key. Okay, where we store the public key, we store it in the DNS key resource record. And there's uh, another uh, resource record called DS, which is the de delegation signer or chain of trust pointer. And this is one of the last uh, slides. Uh, we are, we are going to fast uh, try to explain what is, what is the, 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 DS, the DS record, okay? This is the, what we already, already explained it. And what, what is the DS record? The DS record, let's go fast here. Okay, what's the DS record? So the DS record, it's, it's a way to solve uh, what is called a trust, trust problem or, or potential trust issue. What is this? You, you remember that we, we, we said that the authoritative server is going to be sending the recursive server three, mainly three, <clears throat> three groups of data. It's going to send the original uh, data for the result record we are we are we are carrying. It's going to send the digital signature and it's going to send the public key. Okay, so you get the public key. But the, normally the question there is, okay, how can you make sure that the public key you are getting is the real public key? And it's not a fake public key that someone manages to send to you because that person wants to use a fake private key to sign a tampered, uh, tampered data. So you have to make sure that the public key you are getting is the, the real one, it's not a fake public key. How can you do that? Okay, and that, that's what, when, when someone called, some, something called chain of trust come into, into action. What is this? You remember that Carlos explained that the DNS, it, it's kind of an inverted tree database. Yeah, when you have the root at the top of the, of the, of the resolving path, let's say, and then you have, you know, first level domain, second level domain, and, and so on. So we are talking now about a resolver in some of those uh, levels, which is sending you information. Basically, we are talking now about it sending you the public, its public key, okay? What we are going to do is to generate, uh, 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 but basically we generate a hash of the public key in the result in the authoritative server, and we send that hash of the public key to our father, so to the to the delegation uh, point in, in 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 one step up in the in the in the domain name tree. For example, if we are uh, the uh, dot com uh, operator and we, we, we managed to sign all the resource records contained in the .com, we have to sign 
our uh, to make the hash of our public key and send it to our father. The father of the dot com is the root, the dot. Okay, so we have to send it to the root operator, and the root operator is going to get that hash, which is the hash of your public key, and it's going to sign it. It's going to sign it with its own key. Okay, and the resolver when it gets that public key, it it can check with it, with the father of that. It can check that by validating that that uh, that that uh, signature of the public key can be sure can make sure that that's the original public key. Okay, so in this in this uh, in this kind of of summary, we are uh, the authoritative of some uh, of some domain at some level, and we send the hash of our public key to our father. Our father signs it with its own private key. He will also have its public key sent to the father and so on until you reach the root. So now all the, this, this is what it, by the way, this is what is called chain of trust because each level trust in the father. And you can, if you are the resolver and, and you are checking, you are validating the, all the signatures, you can go up to the root to know if everything is okay with the public keys. Once you get to the root, there's a problem there. You have to make sure which is that you have to make sure that the root key is the real one and no one tampered with it. And the root has no father because it's the root. So there's a, 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 a at first that could, you say, you may think that there's a problem there. And what it's the solution to that, it's a protocol that it's the, the that it, that it's being created about, correct me, Carlos, if I'm wrong, but it's like kind of 11 or 12 years ago. In 2010, 11 years ago, it was put in production or in operation uh, uh, at the key signing, the root key signing protocol, which is uh, the, 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 the process to generate the, the, the root private key and the public key and to sign the root zone and to sign all the DS records also with, the, with, the, with that uh, private key. So that process, it's, it's, it's basically performed in what we normally call the, key, the root key signing ceremony or ceremonies, which are performed four times in a in a year and are public and are streamed uh, via your stream it through through all the the internet so anyone can uh, attend virtually attend those those ceremonies and make sure that everything goes right there and 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 as the root has no father the trust for the roots it's basically through that protocol it's the trust for the root is uh, resides in trusting some some protocol and and basically uh, uh, some people, because no one has the only uh, the only credentials to access to access that that information. That's that's uh, not not very complex, but it's not a, a something that we can go through now. We will need kind of another presentation to go through all the the the, the root signing ceremonies and all its its you know its small details. But any anyway, what you probably would like would Keep in mind is that that the trust for the root key is it's uh, I mean it's based on what we call community representatives that are people that has a piece of information a piece of the credentials which is needed to access the the root the root key and to to perform the the signing of the root zone. So you don't need only one of those pieces. You need a couple or three or or, or for those pieces to be able to access the, the key. And that's the way the security of the root keys is performed. Okay. This is the summary. If you, if you have to keep something in mind for the, for the lab, you keep in mind that what we do is we have uh, resource records that were, weren't originally secured by the, by the DNS protocol. By adding DNSSEC, what we mainly do is we have in the authoritative servers the, 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 the content of the resource record, we hash, then sign it and send to the resolver the answer, as Carlos explained it. So it's the original data. And we also send the public key and we send the uh, signature. And the resolver, by using the public key and the signature, can get the hash and then it can compare that hash to the hash uh, performed to the original data. And by that, by doing that, the resolver will be able to. Very far, verify, or as we call it in the DNS, sec 
language, it <laughs> validates the signature. And that's okay. all. I hope Nico, we have a question. Yeah. Okay. Before before we go into the break, we have a question, yeah. I think. Guillermo? Yeah, I can hear you. There was a glitch in the matrix. Yes, uh, Marcio, Marcio <laughs> ch ch changed me to 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 attend. I, I I deserve it because I took I take yeah me too me too a couple Different, of minutes definitely. more. So it's thanks <laughs> thanks for that, Marcio. <laughs> so we are back. Uh, uh, should we go through the question again? I don't know if you managed to hear the question. Maybe you already answered it because I I I, I no no to I was I I just rejoined as a panelist. Uh, so Etienne <laughs> says that uh, where okay. there are. Any any <laughs> special considerations when implementing implementing in provider or IX environments? Uh, I can take that one. I mean, when you when you implement DNS or DNSSEC in a provider environment, uh, there's nothing very special that you need to take care of. Uh, I would say that if you are going to have multiple DNS DNS servers please try to have them in different subnets for security reasons. It's easier for it's, it's easier to mitigate denial of service attacks in that way. But in, in the case of IX environments, there is an interesting, there's an interesting side to that question, whether the IX has a, a connection to the internet. Uh, if you're going to deploy, for example, a recursive server in the internet, in a IX, sorry, it needs to be able to do recursion all over the internet. So it will eventually need perhaps a second connection to be able to connect to the internet. Um, so there is nothing special per se in the DNS servers. However, you need to take care of the actual connectivity needs of the service. If you're going to deploy, for, to deploy an authoritative server, for example, in an IX environment, perhaps you don't need that connectivity to the internet. <coughs> Sorry, I have a very bad cold. Also, to, to add something to what Carlos mentioned, if, if so, mainly it's the same as Carlos mentioned. I'm, 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 I have to, I want to add something to the, to the connectivity potential issue that because some IXPs, normally an IXP, the main, uh, the main motive for <laughs> creating an IXP is not to provide internet connection, despite some, some IXPs, of course, can provide internet connectivity to its members, but the, 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 the main issue is to provide connectivity among the members, you know? So as Carlos said, you have to make sure if you are setting up a, a server, whether it's uh, recursive or, or, or authoritative server, you have to make sure that you have good internet connectivity. For example, if you are running a, a copy, if you, if you want to install a copy of a root server uh, in your IXP, the, 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 the operator of that root server We'll have to. We'll need access to that root server, you know, to update the, the root zone and to perform the, the operations and the and maintenance of that server. And it's going to use internet access to do that. So if you don't have good internet access in your IXP, maybe it's better to locate the DNS in some of the some member of the IXP and provide access basically to advertise your your DNS prefixes to the to the IXP. Or if you have, on the other hand, if you have good connectivity in your IXP, as Carlos mentioned, you can, you know, place your resolver or your authoritative server in the IXP itself, so anyone can benefit from that. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> uh, we are going to now. We are what we are going to do is to to try to <laughs> implement all all this stuff we talked to you about with Carlos in the previous session, and 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 and, and try to do it. In a in a as close to real life as possible. To do that, what we have uh, set up is uh, 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 you know we set up some virtual machines that you will you will be uh, allocated. Some of them, each of you will will be allocated what we call a group, which is a group of of virtual machines for you uh, to use, and you will be that will be for you. For, for each of you alone to use. I mean, you are not going to share uh, uh, any of those uh, virtual servers with anyone. So you are going to have plenty of control. You are going to have the root access to each of those uh, machines, each of those servers, and you're going to set up all uh, recursive servers, authoritative servers, be able to sign them, sign your song, create your song, and, 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 and all the stuff. We are going to be going through that little by little along this, this, this lab. 
And what we are going to also do is we are going to leave the lab up and running until uh, Saturday midnight. So you will have all the rest of today and all tomorrow, Friday, you will have all that, that, uh, that uh, time to, to continue the practice and to end with the practice. So don't worry if you are not able to follow the practice at the same piece we are going to, to be doing with Carlos because you will have plenty of time to complete your, uh, to complete your, your tasks. Uh, you will have basically two more days uh, today and tomorrow, one, one day and a half to complete all the, all the, all the lab. Uh, anytime you want, and you will also have the the, the 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 lab script, so the lab guide with all the the, the configuration steps you have to go through, and I will provide uh, Carlos and me. We are going to provide you with our email address. So if you have any any question or or if you get stuck in some in, at some point, you can ask us uh, for for help or just you know ask any question or any comment you have regarding the lab or regarding the, the topics we talk about. So let's start with this. First of all, you have to get a, a, a group. You have to get your own uh, group of, 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 of machines. To do that, what you are going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy paste here in the, in the, in the chat. I'm going to copy paste um, uh, a link. You are going to go to that, to that address. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to let me let me share let me find it okay here this is it I'm going to share this so uh, are you are you able to see my screen Carlos yes perfectly okay so what I'm going to what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, open the chat here because I, I close it okay and I'm going to paste here the the link for this form you're you're seeing here so you have to just put your name here. I, I invite you to use your real name and surname here. Uh, that's the only uh, the only data that is going to be visible to to all. And then this is optional. You can put here your your email. This is going to be only for Carlos and me. And this is going to be all data that will be deleted after we close the lab. So no one is going. This is not going to be disclosed or kept for anything beyond the, the this lab. It's just because if if we had any 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 communication for you during the during the lab, we can we can contact you by using that address. So you put your name here and your email address here, and send and press uh, send, and then you'll you'll be uh, assigned a, a group of of servers for for your own for you to use during the during the lab. We invite you all to 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 complete this form and 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 be able to get uh, to get a group of of servers. Once you complete this, uh, you will have to access a second document, which I'm 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 putting the, the, the link here also in the chat. That 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 is a, a link to a to a Google uh, spreadsheet. If you if you access this, you're going to see your name and you're you're going to see this. Okay. This is the, the, the screen you are going to see. You see here, this will update automatically with the, with the, with the, with the form. So now uh, I have Carlos and me, we have the group number one. Yeah. Then uh, here, for example, Brian will have, will be group two. And then, then there's a, a complex name that I don't know if I'd be able to spell it, but something like El Terro, El something. Terro we'll have, yeah, we'll have a group number three. And come on, we are 15 attendees and only three, and only two completed the, the form. So we will, we will get- Don't a, be shy, we'll don't be shy. Yeah, yeah, just, I mean, the, the, the fact that you get, yeah, the fact that you get uh, the the a, a group doesn't mean that you have to do all the, the the practice don't worry if you are not able to to perform all the tasks or you don't have time to perform all the tasks just get the the server and and, and try to at least do some of the tasks either now or, or or later or tomorrow okay okay yeah christopher got number four group number four so you, you can you can just copy paste this uh, this link the link for this for this document i'm sharing uh, 
So if you forgot what's your group number, you, you will be able to know it or just write it down in, in the side of or in a paper. So Christopher, you are number four. So you know that you, you will be group number four till Saturday. Baudelio will be number five. Come on, don't be shy, as Carlos said. <laughs> Just try to get your get your 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 group. We can. I don't know, Carlos, if you have if you want to comment something while we wait for 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 everybody to to get a group. Uh, yeah, the same thing. Don't be shy. It's an it's a it's quite an unique opportunity to try out some of the things we've been discussing during the morning. Uh, don't worry if you uh, have some uh, difficulty following some some of the steps. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's just for you to get, um, I would say, your feet wet on some some of the things we discuss over during the morning. Ah, uh, okay. Someone says that it changed and yeah, and, and it's not okay. I'm going to I'm going to to put to put the, the links again both links, the, the form, and then the, the, the link to view the, the designated group number here. Okay, there it is. Form to get the group number first, and then the link to view my designated group number. So there you go. May, may, maybe a good thing is if you, if you just copy that into a, into a document. So if you, if you, you know, when we disconnect the, the Zoom, you will, we will lose access to this chat. So you have it, you know, in a, in a text. Uh, in your own machine, so you can go back and when you want. Okay. All right. Something happened here. Let me open it again. This one. We have number six for Errol. That's it. Errol. That's it. Errol number six. Victor Manuel number seven. Yep. Perfect. And while we while we while while you complete your 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 machine's allocation, I, I also want to comment that the the idea behind this lab is that we are going to be doing this in 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 our, it's it's a, actually it's a real environment. We are using we are we are not using a fake DNS infrastructure. We are using the real DNS infrastructure. We are we are going to have a a real uh, domain name, and you are going to each of you each of you you are going to get a delegated uh, authority for your own uh, for your own authoritative server, and it's going to be a real one. It's going to be you know out there in the real DNS world. Uh, only we will use uh, private addresses. So if you carry for uh, for us for your domain, you will see that the answer is not a public IP address. It's a private IP address. So it will be only accessible from within. The, the lab infrastructure and not not for the rest of internet but anyone in, in in internet will be able to carry for for the names so i think we can continue nico uh yeah. in, in any okay. case i will keep the i will keep this the spreadsheet open in case uh someone else fills the form and i will paste the links back if it's needed excellent so so just to go fast through the through the already allocated machines brian it's group two Eltero something, it's group three. Christopher is group four. Baudelio, it's group five. Errol, it's group six. Victor Manuel is group seven. And Etienne is group eight, right? The rest of you just go on and, 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 and try to complete the form and, and get, your, get your group. I'm going to, just in case, copy paste it once again in the chat so you have it there, okay. So now you have your group, okay? Next thing to do is to access the the guide the lab the lab script so you you, you will have uh, all the tasks that we were uh, we were about to 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 complete to access the, the 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 lab you have to go to this domain which is the domain for the lab we created this this domain uh, for the lab and the, the the lab script is host in 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 that domain i'm going to copy paste the the domain in the in the chat now, so you will have it also. Please copy paste it in your in your browser. the 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 domain name is bz.t 
labs.training. So if you go there, you should be able, you should be able to see this, this, uh, this page. Are you able to, to see this from your, from your computer? Someone in the, maybe yes. you can post yes. in the chat. Okay. Okay. So once, once you are here, this, this is going to be all the, all the tasks and the configuration step by step you are going to be doing with and explaining with Carlos through this through this lab and then the last thing you have to do is to access your your virtual environment to access your virtual environment you have to you have to to go to i'm going to you, you will you will have to access uh, something like this which i'm sharing you which is a topology and you will have you know i'm group 1 so i will i will have this is this will be my 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 network and my all my all the servers I have to access this you have to go here I'm going to copy paste it in the in the in the chat now so you will have to copy this and when it says grpx you you have to change the x for your group number so for example as Carlos and me we are group one we change the x here in the browser you see the 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 one here, group one. If you are group uh, 10, you will have to put here group 10, okay? And you will access your the group 10. Just, just make sure that here it shows your group, your group number and not someone else group number. From now on, you will be using this as your as your the, 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 the main page to access any of your of your of your servers. Okay. Once you are here. You will need the last resource you will need is the password to access your your uh, your equipment let's let's say i want to access my uh, resolver one yes this this machine here so if i want to access my resolver one mm -hmm. i just go and press over my resolver one that will open a new window in your browser with already some information already there this is the ip of the of the of the host name you you don't have to change anything of this the only thing you'll have to do is to put the password for your machine here where it says password. And I'm going to send you the link to download, to download. Just please download it. Do not, do not open it uh, right in Google Docs. Just download that file, which is a, a text file, a, a CSV, comma separated values file. Uh, just download that to your machine so you have it locally. That has the password to all the, 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 the resources, please. Try to only access your, your resources. That file, I'm going to, to show you the, the, the content of that file here. This is the content of the, of the file, which is the list of all the servers, of all the group servers, and the password. So mainly we have two kinds of servers. If we go back to the, to the topology, we have this, the client, and then we have all these servers. So we have you have one client, which is meant to, to be used as a, as a, as a client uh, computer, for example, to, to send some queries and to do some text. And then you have five servers to configure. This SOA, we will go through this with Carlos in, in a couple of minutes. You have this SOA server, we have uh, two resolvers, and we have two authoritative secondary servers. So all these are the servers, and this is the only client. If you go to the passwords, Sorry, let me find the passwords. If you go to the password file, yeah, you will have for, for us, for me and Carlos, that we are group one, it says group one client. And this is the password. This is the password for the client. All these, including the equal at the end that you are not being able to see it here, but there's a, an equal sign at the end. And uh, if you are group uh, 11, for example, this is the password for your client. And then all the servers have the same password. So if you are group 11 and you want to access a server, not the client, a server, you go here and you say, okay, group 11, and this is the password. You are not able to see it here, but if you download the file, you will be able to. This is the password for all the servers. So all the servers, all the servers have, all the servers, all these one have the same password and the client has a different password, okay? so. I'm going to, for example, access the Resolver 1 server now. So I press Resolver 1, and I need the Resolver 1 password here. I'm going to, uh, to copy the, 
the the password for 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 that uh, for that which is uh, the, the the group one server password okay I'm going to copy from the file and paste it here and do connect okay and voila I'm here I'm into the I'm I'm connected to the resolver okay so tell me if you were able to reach this far try to access resolve one your resolve one okay and 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 please post in the chat uh, those of you that are already have a allocated group of servers try to access resolve one which is the first one we are going to be configuring excellent so byron access. byron says i'm in excellent okay, byron. byron excellent so, and just just wait wait there as soon as you are able to access your resolve one we can wait just you know one one more minute for the rest to 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 be able to access so you basically once you 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 are in the you reach this you press resolve one it will open a window like this and you need the password so you download the 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 passwords from the from the passwords files i i posted in the in the chat and just copy paste the group x with your group number server password there okay including the equal sign at the end of the of the password the equal is part of the password right etienne is in etienne is in okay just take your time we can wait another minute right carlos and then just start with it yeah with the sure Okay, I will wait here. Okay. Errol is in also, good. Awesome. I think you can start with the first part of the, okay. of the lab. Okay. Let, let's, 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 let's start. Uh, remember that keep trying to, 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 to get into the, into your servers. If, if you cannot get into your servers, please post it here in the chat and, and Carlos may, may help you uh, connect while, while sure. we, or, or I may help you connect where, where we explain the, the first part and then you will have time. Remember that you will have plenty of time to, to perform all these, all the steps are kind of uh, all, it's all here. So you can come here and, and do uh, later what we are going to do, to do now, okay? So first thing, just very fast, we have this topology. Each of you will have uh, a network like this. You will have a router, which you're not going to access this time. So don't try to access it. Uh, this, you will have a client, We'll have two resolvers that we are going to configure now at, at first. Then we are going to configure this, which will be our hidden, uh, hidden from the internet uh, authoritative server. And then we will configure these two as secondary authoritative servers that this will be public to all the internet. So these are the ones that we will carry in case we have to resolve some, some, uh, some record from our, our own domain. And each of you will create a, a, a unique domain for you to test. Uh, why this topology? This is this is part of this could be part of a you know DNS operations talk, but very fast. And Carlos, feel free to add anything you 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 think it's good to this to what I'm going to say. This this is a, a very common and kind of suggested topology. It's not the the, the only one. Each uh, network has its own you know. Uh, characteristics or or ways of, of of deploying things. This is just an example, a suggested uh, topology. If you are running uh, resolvers and you're running authoritative servers, keep in mind that uh, of course the resolvers doesn't need to be open to all the internet. We don't normally we don't like open resolvers unless you are a company running a public uh, open resolver like the the the. You know the quad A or the one 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 or the nine 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 server or whatever. You normally, if you run a, a resolver, you're gonna be only allowing your 
clients, your customers to access that resolver. So in this example, we, 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 we put that into a, a, a network that we call internal. This, this network is going to be only meant to be only accessible by our clients, not the full internet will be able to access this network. So the resolvers will only be able to be accessed by our clients. This is like our only customer in this example. And then we will have two public uh, authoritative servers. If you run authoritative servers, by definition, those have to be has to be accessible by the full internet because you run an authoritative server and you want you want anyone to be able to resolve your your domain. So those have to be public. You don't want that to be closed so only to your customers, except in some special cases. So we put we place them in a in a DMC. Yeah, this is like our public accessible network, and this network will be open to all the all the world, all the internet. In our case, it will be open to all the to all the lab. So anyone in the lab, no matter in which group is, will be able to to carry our domain once we we have configured. Okay, and our our authoritative hidden server, which it will be the one that has the real and the, the the configuration and the signature and everything for our domain. It's placed in the internal uh, in the internal network. Normally, you 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 can place this in 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 a different network that will be only accessible by the administrators of this, so by us, and only be accessible. This server will be only accessible by these two servers. They will get the copy of the zone from this server, and they are the ones that are publicly providing the, the, the resolution, the authoritative resolution. So no one will be able to access this or tamper with this information. Okay. This is a, a common suggested topology for, for DNS operation. Okay, let's let's move on. This, this is the, just each of you have all these, uh, these servers, you know, one client, two <laughs> authoritatives, two resolvers and the hidden SOA, just, you know, you have to replace the X with your group number. This will be the IPs of each the IPv4 and the IPv6 address for each of your resources, including, of course, changing the X with your own uh, group number, okay? So let's move to configuring our first server. The first server we are going to configure is a resolver, okay? So it's gonna be a, a, a server that will get queries from the clients and try to find the answer and return the answer to the clients, okay? That's that's the, 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 the main task of a, of a resolver. In this case, we are going to be configuring a resolver based on Bind software, which is one of the famous uh, softwares for, for, for resolvers. And this is this this is pre the, the software the bind software is pre uh, download in 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 your resolve one server. So access your resolve one server. We are here. Here is our, my resolve one because I'm group one. Uh, my resolve one server, and we are going to configure this. To configure this, I will first change to root. So I have plenty of 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 access to all server configuration and resources. To do that, I execute this Unix command, sudo su minus, that's it. And I, I copy paste the same password I used to access this. So the password here is the same password you use to access their server. So I copy paste the server for my group, server password for my group, which is group one in my case. I copy paste there and that's it. I'm in, okay? So now I'm root of my server. Bind software, it's located in etc slash bind directory, okay? I list the content of, of that directory. This is like uh, ls to list the content of the directory. And I, I put this, all these options just to make it look more human friendly. <laughs> so this is all the, all the, all the files that uh, the bind installation leaves in your, in your server. This is just the software installed. I, 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 this, doesn't have any, any previous configuration. So this is what you will get if you download and install the software from scratch, okay? Uh, so just go back to the, to the script and try to follow this. Change to root, we already did it. Change to the bind directory. And now we are going to edit 
the first configuration file of our resolver to start configuring our resolver. You, you see here uh, the configuration, there are many configuration files. This is, there is a named.conf.options, there's a named.conf.local, there's a named.conf and a named.conf the full zones. All these file, all, all these configuration files have uh, different purposes. We are not going to go through all of them in detail because this is not about uh, buying, but more general about configuring a resolver. Of course, you have plenty of information of, about this in, in, in internet, how, how does, what's the purpose of each of these configuration file, uh, a lot of options that we are not going to mention and a lot of configuration options we are not going to mention in this lab, but you can, you know, if you like bind for as a resolver, you can, you know, dive deeply into all of this, uh, of this uh, bind stuff and configuration uh, options you have in case you don't find or you, you, you don't find any, any information about this, drop us an email and we will point you with to, we will answer you with a couple of links where you can get plenty of information about bind and how to configure it. So the, the, according to the script, the first file we are going to access is the name options. This is the file we are going to, to, to edit and configure this one here, name options. I use this editor nano. Some of you may use another one called BI or anyone, anyone, uh, any, any other nano and BI are already installed. Use the one that you prefer. I have this discussion with many friends. I'm a nano fan. They say that. But that role is a, is, a, is a VI fan like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a nano yeah. fan. Most of my friends know, says that nano is for weak people. I, 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 anyway, I like nano. They, 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 they are masochists and they, they like buy. I like nano. It's more easy to move and to copy paste. Anyway, Errol, okay, you are, you are kind of best of both worlds. Beam, it's a kind of best of both worlds, a mix of nano and, and B. Yeah, okay. So to, to access the, the file, you just, you know, in case you like nano, ask me, you put nano space and the name of the file and voila, we are here. This is the configuration file we are going to modify. This is, this already came into the, come in with the, with the, with the bind installation. So very fast, this is the, this is the directory that where binds will store all the cache. You remember that, for example, the, 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 we, we mentioned that uh, bind is going to, to use uh, and make use of some kind of cache, re any resolver is going to use it. That will be in memory, not in any file, but in case the software needs to write something to disk, this will be the place where it will place all the, all the cache in this case. Don't, do not modify this. We don't need to modify this at this time. Uh, these are all comments. So now here it's explain, it explains a lot, of, a lot of stuff. It says, oh, if there is a firewall between you and the name servers you want to talk to, you may need to fix the firewall. So this is telling you that just, okay, take into consideration that if you have, and you will probably have uh, security measures, just don't forget to configure your firewall to make this server accessible by whoever you want to access it and, and all the stuff. Say, so, oh, my, my server is not working. Okay, yes, that's because you, you do not, properly configure your, your firewall, okay? Uh, we don't have a firewall in this case in front of our server because this is a lab, and, but you know, in real life, don't do this. <laughs> Just put a firewall always between you and the rest of the world. So you make sure what stuff uh, may access and what, what other resources were not meant to be accessed from the outside, okay? Uh, and these are the only two commands that came already in place, which is DNSSEC validation auto and listen on v6any, which is the, what's DNSSEC validation auto? Okay, this makes our life far, 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 far easier. DNSSEC validation auto will automatically enable DNSSEC validation in our resolver. So yes, if you install a bind resolver now, the last version, it will already come with DNSSEC validation enabled. So you don't have to do anything to enable DNSSEC on your resolver. If you install it now, the last version, it will make sure, just make sure that you have this command in this configuration file and this will make all the magic 
to enable validation, DNSSEC validation for our server. So now with this, our server is validating DNSSEC. And this basically allows, uh, enables IPv6 access to our server. Our server has, we have, uh, this is the result one. We have IP, an IPv4 and we have an IPv6 address allocated to this, to this machine. So we will also keep this to have either IPv4 and IPv6 access to our server. And here it says any, which means that anyone, this, this server, this resolver will be accessible from any, any computer or device in the internet, as long as our firewall allows it. But as our firewall, as we don't have a firewall here, this is basically open to the world. This is not something we, we, we want, so we will change it in a while. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, to the script. And now here it's a copy of this file we are talking about. And now what we are going to, to add to our, we, we already have this, the DNSA validation auto, and we already have the, the listen on v6 any. So we are going to, to add some, uh, some lines to our configuration. We are going to add, basically we are going to add these four lines and that will be all. With this, we should be able to get the, our server up and running. So to bring up a resolver using bind in this case is as simple as downloading the bind software in your in a Unix. Uh, in this case, it's, it's uh, our, our servers are running Ubuntu, Ubuntu server. So I have a fresh Ubuntu server installed. I installed the bind uh, packages, that's one command. And then just edit this file we are talking about and add these four lines. So you edit the named conf options file. You add these four lines and you're up and running. What are these four lines? Okay, this, the first one. It says, listen on port 53. This is enabling, enabling this resolver to listen on port 53. You know, port 53 is the, is the standardized normal port when a resolver, when a DNS server in general will listen to incoming, uh, incoming queries or incoming requests. And this here between brackets is the, uh, it's telling us who is going to be able to access this. So this server will listen to incoming uh, queries from local host. So if I send any, any test or if I, if I try to resolve from the, from the self uh, server, it will be able to, to access. And also I put this IPv4 here, which means that all the lab, this is the, the, the IPv4 prefix for all our labs. So all the lab machines, your group and the rest of, of the groups will be able to use this as a, as a resolver and only will be accessible by the lab and not by the rest of the, of the world, okay? So I'm going to add this line to, to enable and, and, and allow for, for, for that. To do that, I just, you know, step here and I, I add the lines and copy and paste, okay? And I'm going to just to make this look prettier. I'm going to add a tab here, okay? Okay, so there we are. The second line we are going to add, this one, listen on v6 port 53. This is the same as the previous one, but for v6, just I'm going to allow, also allow IPv6 uh, carries to this server on, on the same port to the local host and to this prefix, which is the whole lab prefix. Okay, this is the IPv4 prefix, lab prefix, and this is the IPv6 lab prefix. So I control Z, copy this file and copy this line, sorry, and paste it here. Okay, and next one, allow carry. This is, this can be kind of confusing with the other one because it's more, more, it's very, very related or more or less the same as the other, but th this, is not to which I'm going to listen to, but which one will be able to carry. In, in some, in some uh, DNS configurations, this, this, this you know, lines and this one, the listen on and the allow carry could be different. In the configuration we are, we are doing here for the lab, the information that we are going to use in the listen on 
either v4 or v6 and the allow carry will be the same so we again we will allow to carry this server localhost the whole lab uh, ipv4 prefix and the whole lab ipv6 prefix in this case you put both in the same line you don't need two different uh, lines there's not allow carry v6 for this it's everything goes in the same line so we copy this line and we passed it in our server also okay remember remember to make sure that you are copy pasting exactly the same as you have you have here okay and the last line we are going to add which is probably the most important one is this recursion yes what does this means this enables recursion for our server remember that we are setting up a resolver so if it has to be a recursion has to be enabled because a resolver has to do recursion if if a resolver cannot do recursion it won't be a resolver <laughs> so because recursion allows for you to go and find the answer not to only serve the info you already have if you are running a, an authoritative server you don't need recursion if you're running a resolver you need to enable recursion so we are going to enable recursion okay we are going to enable recursion and to do that i'm going to put it at the end just to it doesn't matter you remember you <coughs> one yeah. of my my slides i had an example of a server that doesn't have permission to do recursion uh that would be the case when you do when you said recursion no yeah maybe carlos in the, we can first tr tr test all this and then we can just edit the file set recursion no and see what happens okay okay it, it will be funny because maybe if we have something yeah. in the cache it will be able to serve it but anything that is not in the cache it will answer uh, recursion desired but not available so the resolver won't be able to find it <laughs> Uh, basically, if you don't put recursion yes, you don't have a resolver. Okay, so you better make sure that you put recursion yes. Okay, so that's that's all. This is all the configuration uh, we are going to to do today for this resolver. And now we press to exit and save this. You press Control X and says save modifier buffer. Yes or no? You press yes, and then you press enter and just i'm going to do more to 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 just list the content of the file to make sure that we all our changes are there and here you see this is all the configuration we we did it's already there so the file it's 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 already in place now we are going to check the configuration we are going to use this command called name check conf this command comes with the bind installation and it's a very useful tool to check the semantics of your configuration this will go through all your configuration files this will all go through all the configuration files all the configuration files and check if you have something that is not permitted or you miss uh, you miswrote something or whatever so you just execute name conf name it uh, check conf uh, app and it doesn't return anything no news good news in this case if it doesn't if it does not return any anything that means that your configuration is perfect just for you to see i'm going to edit the file and i'm going to put something wrong on purpose in the configuration for you to see that the configuration is going to be doing it's going to be telling that i have an error somewhere okay you see unknown option the little in line 31 and expect a token near mm, in line 32. So there's a problem with line 31 and 32. So I go to here and say, oh, what is this? I should delete this, okay? So I'm going to just get rid of that, save the configuration again, and check conf again. Oh, now my configuration is okay. I can go, go on, okay. Finally, to make bind server take the changes and, and and you know apply the changes we've already done to a configuration file we have to restart the server so there's a there's a, a this is the command to restart the server yeah so system control is a it's a it's a, an ubuntu uh, application that comes with the operating system 
that controls the status and, and uh, of, uh, of of any of any of any daemon of any application running in your server. In this case, our application it's by nine. There are a lot of lines of, there are a lot of applications running in in that server. But anyway, this is the one we install and configure, it, and this is the one we're going to deal with during the lab during this part of the lab. So to restart by nine application, we do we set we we use this command system control restart. And the, the name of the application, which in this case is bind nine. Okay. There are other ways of restarting applications. You may use whatever you want. If you know another way of doing this, just use your way. Okay. I like to use this one. So I send that command, and that, that should be all. How, how can I check that everything is okay? I'm going to use the same uh, command system control, but I'm going to use status instead of restart status bind nine and if i do that you can see here uh, you can see here sorry okay you can see here that it says a lot of information about the 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 the, the, the bind nine application the bind nine server it says that uh, this is a domain name server it's loaded this is the, the where the server is loaded. don't care about that here this is one of the things you have to check that here in green says active running. If you see here a red text says, telling you that it stop, it says stop it, you have problems. Something it's probably something it's wrong in the configuration. Even there's no uh, problem with the semantic of the configuration because we run this and we do not get, we did not get any error. You, there can be something wrong in the in the in the configuration you configure something in a way that it's okay from the point of view of the semantics but it's not permitted or, or something is not working or the server for example uh, it's uh, all the configuration files are okay but your server uh, doesn't have internet access so you will get here that it's not running because it will won't be able to to download and to perform some some tasks but if you see this in green and running it everything should be okay and here you have the last uh, the last few lines of the log which tell you if there's an error, if there's a problem, it will tell you that that uh, it will give you a clue of where to find your your issues. But here, doing a performing a fast look at all these, yeah, it says that all zones are loaded. Here we don't have any any specific zone because this is only running as a resolver. So this is not an authoritative server. We have we haven't configured any zone of our own here, but the resolver can be in some places and in some cases configure it to 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 get or to be running locally some some zones in that case it will it will load that zones and you will you will check that by by this here okay so our our resolver should be now up and running okay this is what we did checking the status of the bind nine and you get this this is what we already 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 see here okay that's the end of the first part, the end of configuring a bind server. Okay, now we, we will we, we can do some some tests. Okay, Nico, the first test. Nico, yes, we should Carlos. Nico, Nico, we should yeah. do a five minute break. Okay, uh, and then we can continue. Okay, just so, a very short uh, break. Uh, let people catch up with uh, logging into the servers, okay. and uh, I'll be here handling some uh, if if there are any questions. I've been answering Perfect. some questions for people who had some issues uh, accessing the lab. And okay. I think we are fine. We should do a short five minute break and then come back. So we can buy uh, by 15, right? It's uh... exactly correct. So, so it's 11 15 Belize time, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. We'll come back in 11, at 11 15 uh, Belize time to do some tests and to go with the next configurating the next server. Excellent. I think we can resume. Uh, uh given given that it's already uh 11 20 i would say that i would suggest that you skip the configuration of unbound and go straight to the configuration of a authoritative zone okay what do you think yeah yeah we can we can we can leave the configuration of unbound for 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 the unbound, attendees you can uh, check it later it's the same yeah. only it's a different exactly. kind of software it's, so it's, you can go through through it and take the same yeah sure um, 
uh, while Nico gets ready, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Unbound and diversity in DNS software. Unbound is a different implementation of the DNS protocol. Unbound is a recursive only uh, server. And it's usually a recommended practice if you have a large installation of DNS servers to run a diverse base of software. Why? Because if there is a bug that affects one of them, um, it won't bring your whole uh, DNS set of servers down. It's, um, it's common practice if you have large installations, if you're a small ISP, maybe the additional complexity of running different software, maybe it's not worth the effort, but if you're a large operator, that's definitely recommended. In, along the same lines of what I mentioned about running servers in different subnetworks. Okay. Um, let me share the screen just uh, to, to perform some, some quick tests on this and, and then we can go to the, to the authoritative configuration, right, Carlos? Sure, okay. let's do that. Okay, uh, so let me find the screen. Uh, I think it's here, okay. It's, are you seeing the screen, yeah? Yes. So this is Very our clear. our our the, the resolver we just configured. Just going to 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 send the the, the last command again, to just to to to, to show you that the, the, the resolver is was running. This was the last uh, the last the last test we did to check the status of our bind resolver. And now we are going to try to locally resolve some some domain. To do that, to do that, we're going to use the the dig command, and we're going to tell that we are going to use the local resolver, the one that we just configured. To do that, we just do dig at localhost, yeah, because we are in the same resolver, and we carry for uh, any uh, any any domain. Just let's carry for uh, let's carry for the lab domain, for example. Okay, this is our lab domain. Let's see if we can resolve. And this is okay. This is this is the the <clears throat> the result of our dig. Here you can see that it says uh, it says we are carrying the local host for this is the domain our lab domain. If we do not spe specify any resource record, it will carry for the A record, which will be which is the the IPv4 address associated with this uh, with this domain uh, this these are uh, some of the of the of the flags that 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 are in, in present in the, in the in the answer this this specific one which which says which is a um, ad it's it means authenticated domain this means that this is this is uh, performing uh, dnssec validation and th this means that that the two things that this means that the, the, the domain we are carrying has DNSSEC enabled. And as we are getting this flag, authenticated domain, and no error here as a status, this means that our resolver, it's running, it's performing DNSSEC validation and was able to successfully validate the signature for this uh, for this domain. So we are getting the, the real information for this domain. And then I got the answer here. So you got one answer here. It says that in, uh, this is the question. This is the, the question we, the, the query we did. Give me the A record of this domain. And the answer is, okay, for this domain, this is the associated IPv4 address. So that's the A record for our domain. That's the response to our carry. And th this is the TTL, the time to leave, the, the time this, the amount of time this, this entry will be valid uh, to store in, 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 the, in the resolver cache. And also here you, 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 you see that it's checking the local host and it, by default this is doing IPv6. So it's checking using IPv6, okay? And 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 uh, another thing we can we can do is to check for the DNSSEC uh, content of this of this query. To do that, we put here DNSSEC, and 
uh, that will give me back the DNSSEC associated resource records for this uh, for this domain. Basically, it will give me the 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 the, the public the public key of, of this. And then I, I use here multi. This is just a, a, a modificator to make the answer more human friendly. Uh, it, it just will it will format format the answer in a in a in a in a more uh, pretty way to look at it. So here you have the same information, but we have here. Uh, sorry, we have here the the same the same information. The IP before address associating with our domain, and this is the RRC results record, which which contains the 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 public key used to sign the the our our record, right? Sorry, this is the, the signature, not the public key, right, Carlos? I, I just mixed the the, the that the is correct. Record. RRC the the um, it's a signature. It's a public record it's a, it's... called RRC is resource record signature. That is the signature that is has been computed using the public key. That's it over That's it. the uh, the record that that is listed above it. That's it. That the, the, so so uh, to just to to make it. To make it clear, the RRC, as Carlos mentioned, is the signature of this record. So this record has a signature that was performed in the authoritative server. And this here is the signature. If we want the uh, public key for this, we have to specify that, that we want the, 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 the resource record that contains the public key. That is not the RRC, that is the DNS key record and if we carry if we look at this again now we just did the same the same carry but adding that we want this resource record specifically and then if we look at the answer we got a lot of more information here we have the dns key and this here yeah this is the public the public key you see that you have here the public key and you also have the the algorithm the algorithm we are using because you have to know the algorithm to be able to apply the same algorithm with that key to be able to decrypt the signature so the algorithm here uh, we are using is rsh 256 okay and this is the key id also this is like the id of this key and uh you have also the 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 same rsi record okay and 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 some other some other some other stuff there and we can also we can also ask for the for the ds record you know the one that you sent to the father to to be able to to build up the the, the chain of trust of trust and if you ask for the ds record here this is the ds record so this is the the the, the hash of our uh our public key the one that will be validated and it's going and it's actually is being validated by the resolver by carrying the, the father of the of this domain. If our domain is, you know, our our, our domain is is this is busy.tlabs.training. So to validate this, basically our resolver is getting the information from here from the father, which is tlabs.training. Tlabs.training has a dot training father, and the father of dot training is the root. Okay. Uh, let's try a, a different a different uh, query just to make sure that we are not making you know any anything work out uh, only for the lab this is a public resolver so uh, carlos what can we ask here throw me a, a domain name random domain name <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well i don't know um, polka one two three four five that exists <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the problem. Maybe it doesn't exist. Okay. Let Let's check for this. For example, I here is it's working. It's resolving. Uh, or or uh, lagnik.net, for example, no? Lagnik. Yep. Net. Okay. It's working. Let's see if lagnik has IPv6 enabled. Oh, this is the time of true Carlos. Yeah, they have IPv6 enabled, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you're we done, do. You, 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 you're done your homeworks. <laughs> uh, we've done our homework, indeed. 
this can be very tragic, right? If I ask the DNSSEC record and it, it says no, it's no DNSSEC. Uh, okay, Nico, these guys are giving uh, a, a DNSSEC presentation and don't have their domain exactly. signed. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Errol is suggesting a domain name to try out. Uh, Errol. Uh, you can see it in the chat. You can see it in the chat window. It's puc.bz. Okay, let me let me copy paste that arrow just not to oh, okay let's check that let's let's check with the dnssec so we, we are going to check everything at the same time puc.bz we know it doesn't have dnssec okay let's see here oh yeah you say it's no error it gives me the answer so this is the ip before associated with the with pack dot bz but if you see here the flags yeah you don't we don't have the ad authenticated domain flag that means that this domain doesn't have a dnssec uh, signature for it so in other in other words the the, the ones that run uh, pack dot bz authoritative server hasn't signed their uh, their domain their their resources their resource records okay so this, in this case, our resolver is getting information, but it's not being able to validate the NSX. So if someone gets into the authoritative server for pack.bc and change this IP address, we won't notice. We will get the fake IP address here, and we will have to trust it because there's no DNSSEC validation to check it, OK? All right. And let me do a last, a last uh, attempt, Carlos which is a, a, um, a place, uh, um, a domain that on purpose has a tampered uh, DNSSEC signature. So someone, uh, the administrators of this domain, the one I'm going to write here, on purpose, they tampered it with their own uh, signature. They put a fake signature and let's see what happens. So this uh, site, I think it's called dnssecfailed.org. Okay, so we, we do that. And you see, I carry for this, for the IP address associated with dnssecfail.org, and we have here, serfail. That's, this means that something is it's wrong with this domain. If I dnssec, let's see what I get. Oh, I, 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 I keep getting the serfail. This means, this is because I mean, from the client perspective, this now I'm a client just caring for a domain, I get a serve fail. So I, I'm not getting the answer. The truth is that I'm not getting the answer because our resolver, it's trying to validate this, but it's not validating. So someone tampered with this signature. As the signatures, the hash doesn't matches, it doesn't give me the correct answer. How to know that, how to, to check that? Well, one way of doing that is to use here, um, uh, an option that it's uh, called CD flag. I think it's this. Yes. If 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 I if I if I do the same query, yeah. But I, now I add CD flag. What this flag? It's telling the 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 resolver is okay. I don't care if you have the NSEC. Uh, the NSSEC validation enable, just don't check the NSSEC. So I'm going to ask the same, but telling the resolver, please don't check the NSSEC. So give me the answer, whatever the answer it is. Now I get the answer. So I got the IP associated with the NSSEC fail.org. But this is not probably it's not the real IP because someone tampered with this. I, I can also ask for. Uh, um, for uh, for the the signature, for example, for this for the signature for this um, for this record for the RRC, yeah, and I and I have this this RRC. This is the signature for for this for the for the record I'm, I'm getting. But and this has you know the, the 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 time frame is valid. So this is the 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 time of creation and this is the expiration and the creation time and we are within this, but the problem is that, oh no, here is the problem, right? Okay, yeah, this is valid. 
but the problem is that this signature is probably fake. So they did this on purpose for us to be able to check it, but this is what happens when someone tampers with the DNSSEC. You won't get the answer, you won't get the answer, you will get serve fail, okay? And that's that's all the checks, the, all the tests for now, Carlos. Do you want to go with the authoritative configuration or do you want me to? If you if you can if you can do it, I'll be okay. grateful. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I, so I, now, when, while you get ready, I will I will uh, comment on what we are going to do now. Next perfect. thing, Nicolas is going to show you guys is how to configure a DNS zone on a server with actual records, and um, which is something you could do when you get a domain delegated uh, from an upstream registry. Okay, so as Carlos mentioned, what you're going to what we're going to do is we are going to configure our first uh, authoritative server. So we go to our our network and we say, okay, what this is the one called SOA will be the authoritative server we are going to configure now. So we click on the on our SOA server. We copy paste the group. In my case, I'm group one. So I'm going to copy paste that group one server password here and connect to the server. And I'm going to change to root. We use the same password here. So I paste the same password and I'm, I became root of this server. Okay, this server, uh, we are going to skip. We were, we were doing this. Uh, we're going to skip this part, which is configuring another resolver using a, a, a different software. You can do that later and, and ask us any question if, you, if some, something is not working. And we're going to skip to this part when we configure a primary authoritative server. We will use the same software we were using for our resolver. We will use bind, but in this case, our bind server will be authoritative one, not recursive one. So basically, we are not going to enable recursion on this, but we are going to create a zone for our own domain here, okay? So we are going to configure a hidden authoritative server, as it says here, and create an authoritative zone, which will be group X, in my case, group one, dot bz dot dot training. So you remember that our lab zone is bz tlab dot training. bc tlab dot training has delegated uh, this domain to me, group one in my case dot bz dot training so what we already know how that delegation is done in in in, in the authoritative server for bz tlabs dot training we pre-configured before starting this lab we pre-configured the server bz tlabs dot training remember that this server is working because we we from the you know from the from our from our resolver we did uh bz.tlabs.training and we get answer so this is the ip address actually this is the ip address of the of the of the of the server this is a public ip address so our server is working you can you can check that dig from any terminal in your computer and and you will get the same answer okay you can do this so without the local host you do just to dig bz.tlabs.training and you get the this answer okay so in that server <clears throat> there's something like this already configured yeah you have we have uh we have delegated the 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 zone to this this server and what we are going to do now is to configure this authoritative server okay so we're, in my case again my domain the domain for the one i'm going to configure the zone now will be group one dot bz dot te dot labs dot training if I was group uh, 13. Here, my zone will be group 13.bz.dlabs.training. Okay. So, how to set up the authoritative zone for my domain? We use the SOA server, we access the SOA server, and we go to the bind directory. Okay. So, uh, let's go back to the server and let's go to the bind directory slash etc slash bind. Bind. Okay. There you are. I, I, I list the content of the of the of the directory. If you see here, is the exact same. Oh, sorry, I just recite the screen. Here is the exact content of the 
of the of the that the resolver has in the beginning only this is a different server so you see this is the same basic bind installation without any any configuration uh, up to this so now we are going to start configuring this in the same way we did with the resolver but in this case we are going to make it uh, make it be a authorita an authoritative server okay so uh what we are going to do bind provides uh, an empty template to create zones so you don't have to write again everything uh, every 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 configuration common in the in the in the zone file it gives you a, an already pre-built template you can use and to to do that as it says here the the the, the template is called db.empty yeah and you see here it's already a file called db.empty let's see what what that file uh, has db.empty you know you see this is the this is a template this is the the content of that file and we are going to use this as our template to 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 start creating our zone to do that we are going to copy this this db empty this file and to copy and to name it the, the the way we want for our zone okay so to do that we are going to copy that file and the file we're going to create is going to be called db.group x when x is my my group name assign group one my file will be called db.group one so i'm going to copy this here and paste it in the in the terminal here i'm going to change the x for one that's it so if i i now have a, a, a my 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 template zone file here db.group one and i'm going to edit it yeah i'm going to edit to end with the configuration of my zone. So this will be my, my, my template uh, for my zone file. And then this is how my, my, my zone file <clears throat> will look like after, after uh, configuring. Of course, here it says you can add as many records as you, as you want. This is our basic, our basic configuration. I'm, I'm just going to, to, to copy paste this, okay? I'm going to copy paste this into the into the into the file and 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 then i'm going to we're going to go through and explain uh and explain what 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 each of these means very fast uh let me just uh let me just delete all this and just you know copy paste this because most of the content is the same as in the in the previous file so as to make it faster i do this okay so I put here, uh, this is a comment because it has a, a, you know, this at the beginning. So this means that this is not a common, a configuration common, but a configuration option, sorry, but a comment. I'm going to change this for group one, just to remind me that this is the, the group one zone file. Uh, okay, so this this first line, TGL, this is the time that this, uh, that this uh, information, when, when this authoritative server answers a query from a resolver, the resolver is going to store in its cache the, the result, the answer, 30, 30 seconds, right? 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Yeah, half, uh, half, half a minute. This is a very, very uh, low uh, uh, TTL, but why we are setting a very low TTA, like 30 seconds? Uh, because this is a lab and we want any change we do to this file to 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 get to get to the to make it to the resolver as fast as we can so if we, if you put here you know uh, one hour once any resolver makes a, a query and gets the answer it will store it for one hour so for one hour it won't ask again the 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 authoritative server for the same information so if you change anything in your authoritative server you will you will have to wait one hour for the resolvers that already has that information in, in their cache to notice the change. So we, we, we will keep this low because this is a lab. If you are in production and you know that your, your, your authoritative information does not change from time to time, does not change often, mm -hmm. you can put, you can set this to, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour, one day, one week, whatever you, whatever you want. But keep in mind that once you set this, 
the, 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 in, in the worst case, you will have to wait that amount of time for all the resolvers to notice the, the change, okay? Carlos, I don't know if you want to comment something on that. No, I would just um, warn people against using very, very short TTLs because it will make the internet hit your server much harder and, must, and, and more uh, often. Uh, 30 seconds is very reasonable for a lab setup like this. In, um, in a production setup, I would recommend things like uh, maybe 600 seconds and, or 300 and, uh, sorry, 3,600 an hour. Those mm -hmm. uh, work better in, uh, in a production environment. Yeah. That said, do remember that when you are going, let's say, let's imagine that you have a, a web server and you need to migrate that web server from one machine to another and it's going to change it, its IP address. <clears throat> You cannot just change the server from one another, change the DNS and pretend that the whole internet will realize of the change at once. Uh, people will keep using their cached information for as long as the TTL is greater than zero. So uh, one trick that we do, and then we just did this, did this, uh, sorry, did this for a change we performed in one of our Lightning servers last week, is to reduce the TTL before doing, let's say the day before doing the migration, uh, make it a, a, take the value to a low number, let's say uh, 60 or 180 or something like that. 180 is very reasonable, so it's three, three minutes. <clears throat> Perform the change. Uh, yeah, for three minutes, some servers in the internet will keep using the old information, but it's not too bad. And then once everything has stabilized, you can get the TTL to its old value, the larger, larger value. Okay. Thanks, Carlos. And then we have uh, we have this in, in our configuration, which is the, the SOA resource record. Do you want me to explain or do you, can, do you want to explain this, Carlos, or fast, or do you want me to as you want? Just to make it more well, uh, the the format the format of the sound file. Yeah, yeah, very fast. Which is yeah, each of these each of these oh. stuff here. We can do very, it very together. quickly. <laughs> yeah, very very quickly. Yeah. Um, the SOA record it's uh, the record you need to have in front of every sound that you configure. It's uh, the the meaning of SOA. It comes from start of authority. It has some general parameters that affect how the internet is going to perceive the sound. The most important, I would say, is the serial number. The serial number actually uh, marks when a change has been performed of the zone. This is important for, uh, for example, secondary servers or uh, servers that need to check whether you have performed changes on your zone. Um, negative cache TTL. That's that's a, that's an interesting <laughs> one to explain before, it's, because it's it's kind of poorly understood. Uh, when you query the DNS for something that doesn't exist, you get an error message that is called NX domain. The funny thing is that NX domains are cached, can be cached. That means negative responses or responses in error can be cached. So um, this negative cache TTL number is actually the cache TTL for those negative answers. So if you ask a server, for something that does not exist, it will cache the NX domain until this negative cache expires. This can be tricky actually. And um, I've been hit by this a lot of times. Uh, 86,400 is the default value for this number. That's a day, uh, one whole day, but it's long. Uh, it's a long, a long time, a long TTL. And um, imagine, uh, Picture this, uh, if you are booting up a server that doesn't have an, I mean, you're, you're trying out something, you're creating or booting up a new server and you are uh, creating a DNS entry for it, but you query your recursive before the actual change in the authority that it has been made, you risk uh, having this negative answer cached for a whole day. So please reduce the negative cash to a more reasonable number. 
it's an it's an old it's an old I would say uh, it's a remnant of an old time uh, having that large cash. Um, then the others, uh, I always get myself confused. Expire has to do with um, zones that are copied from from another zone uh, for uh, secondary servers that copy the zone from a master. Uh, yeah, this, uh, Carlos, that... this, this, this three, sorry, this, this, sorry for interrupting you. This, this three, no, that's um, fine. mainly, that's fine. mainly, mainly has, has to do with, 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 as you mentioned, uh, with the, with the, with the, the, the way uh, you have in, in the configuration, you have a, a main server and a secondary uh, authoritative server. Uh, as you were saying, the secondary servers will, will, will try to, to check if something changed in the primary server, and if something changed, will get will fetch the 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 zone again to 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 have, to always have exactly. An Basically, those three yeah. timers, we, without going into much details, because yeah. we are getting closer to the to the fine finishing time. Uh -huh. um, those three timers actually um, define how uh, zone transfers are going to work. Zone transfers means uh, when servers transfer the whole zone from another server which is used for providing secondary service. Mm -hmm. So um, the rest of the zone file, uh, you have the two NS records. Those records are important because they say, they signal the internet who are the servers that are authoritative for this zone. And from there on, you have your uh, normal, I would say in this case, A and quad A, or TXT or CNAME or whatever you have. But uh, this first SOA and two NSs are um, something that you must always have. Yeah, just to, 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 to follow, follow up with that, this, this, this two, as Carlos mentioned, are, are uh, our, our authoritative servers, uh, the authoritative server for our son. Remember our son is this one, this is our son. So we, 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 our son is group one dot, bc.tlabs.train, so I must change here the x for one. And if, when you copy paste this, you, you should put here your group because your zone will be group, whatever your group is, dot bc.tlabs.training. And then you see here, I have ns1 dot my zone and ns2 dot my, my domain, no? Okay, ns1 and ns2 will be my public authoritative servers. How do I tell that? As Carlos, as Carlos said, by creating ns, name server record. These are the name servers, NS1 and NS2 are the name servers for our domain, okay? And then this here, it's what we call a glue record because here you have the name of the name server, but to reach the name server, you need the IP address. So how do you know the IP address of the name server? You have to add the IP address for each of these two name servers. So you see here it says NS1, you know, you can write NS1 or you can write all this again, as this is the zone file for group training. If you only write this, it will assume that it's this dot the rest of the of the zone. So you don't have to read to to, to write it to always write your your zone, bind will assume that. So NS1 dot group one dot this this server has the IPv4 address. This this one, I have to change here the X for my group number. And it has this IPv6. This is IPv6 of NS1. And NS2 has this IPv4 and this IPv6, okay? And that's, that's I can, as Carlos mentioned, I can add as many other resources, uh, resource records or I, 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 as, as, I, as I want here, but we will just keep it simple for, for this lab. So this is our configuration. This will be our 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 song configuration. Uh, we will we will save this. Okay. Control X. Yes. We will just uh, check that everything it's it's okay. DB dot group one. Everything it's okay. I, I've changed it basically. I changed it all the X with my group number, and everything looks looks good. Remember that if you change again this in the future, you will have to increase this serial number for the server and for the secondary servers and for any every any server that that checks information from here to 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 realize the changes. If you don't do not increase the the serial, 
no matter if you reload the server, it won't take, it won't apply the changes. So you always have to increase this serial each time you edit this file, basically. As this is the first time I'm creating the file, I just put the serial number one. If I edit it once again, I can change to serial number two, number three, number four. You can use uh, your, uh, the, you know, normally another way of, 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 uh, of writing the serial number is to use the, the date and uh, an hour of the change. So you, you will be easier for you to look here and say, okay, this is the time this, this file was last uh, edited. So if I want to do that, I edit the file and I'm gonna change this, this serial here. Instead of putting one here, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put, uh, let me just, uh, let me just uh, put a different thing here. I'm going to put, uh, for example, um, I don't know, uh, two, uh, sorry, 2021, this is the year, the month and the date here and the time. I'm going to put it in uh, 11, 53, that's the, oh, sorry, 11, 53, right? That's the, 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 the time for, for the Belize time zone, okay? That's the serial now. So now by looking here, I, okay, 2021, you know, August 5, 11, 53 was the time that this file was edited. I save this. Okay, that's okay. Okay. If we look at the file, it's already everything, it's already in place there. So next, we have to configure. We, are, we already have our song file created. This is our song file. Okay. Now we are going to uh, configure uh, another uh, configuration file for Bind to, 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 to be able to work as, a, as an authoritative server. Next file we are going to configure is the name.conf.local, right? So we edit that file, okay? We edit the name.conf.local and you see this file, it's, it's empty at this time. It only has this, these comments, okay? And what, you are, what are we going to do in this file? In this file, we are going to specify the name of the zone we, are, we have created for Bind to know which is the zone file. So we are going to make it point to the file we just created. To do that, this is the, 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 the way of, of telling Bind which is the, the song file name. So we are going to copy this. Yeah, copy this and put it here, okay? Name it.conf.local and this is the content. Of course, we will have to change this for our group song, which is our zone is group one, bzdlabs.training. This is our domain. This is the type of zone. This is, this is the type of zone, which is master or primary. They bind uh, now, I, 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 I should have changed this. I didn't, but anyway, I'm going to explain this. Uh, in, the, in the past, uh, primary servers and secondary servers were called master and slaves. As those two words, master and slave has uh, social implications, but very bad social implications. They, I mean, the whole DNS community decided to change those, the way they call those servers from, you know, master and slave to primary and secondary, as well as, for example, other, other DNS related or technical uh, uh, language was, was changing. For example, we, we no longer, normally we no longer uh, call blacklists as blacklists, but we sell block lists instead of blacklist and, and other stuff, you know, just to, 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 to be in, 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 in line with, with, with social, with, with good social practices, because the bad uh, connotations that these, these, these uh, old words mean. Okay. Now the, 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 la the latest versions of bind would, would accept both, would accept either this or would accept that you put here a uh, primary instead of, of, of master. If you have an older version of bind, you, uh, unfortunately, you will have to keep using master here, okay? But you can upgrade to the last version, which is also good because you will have all the, the security benefits and the new features. So I encourage you to, to, to update to the last version and, and use uh, 
primary instead of master here. And uh, just gonna leave it like that. Uh, do not you know, invest any time, any more time on this. This one file, this one is, is the most important we have to, to do here. We have to tell which is the, the file that, it, that, it's con that has our song content, the file we just created. The file we just created, it's in slash etc slash bind and it's called db.group1, remember? Okay, and this last uh, option, allow transfer any, will allow uh, to transfer this zone to any secondary server. So if I, when, I, when we configure the secondary servers, they will be able to fetch the zone from this, from this server. If, we, if you do not put this, even if this server will be working as a primary, no secondary server will be able to get the song from here. So remember to place this here if you are going to have secondary servers. If this is not going to be your only resolver, uh, your only authoritative, you have to do this. If this is going to be your only authoritative, then you don't need this. Okay. But as we have here uh, in our topology secondary servers, we will allow transfer. Okay. That's the, the, all the content. Remember to change uh, the X for your group for your number here and here, and then you control X, yes, save the, the file and you can change, check, name it, dot conf dot local. Okay, everything looks good there. So let's see what else. Okay, these are the two, the only two configuration files we need for our uh, authoritative server to be up and running. Now let's, let's, uh, let's ch check the configuration. I, I skipped that. That here, but we can we can run the 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 the, the you know you remember the the command we we run to to check the configuration in the in the resolver level we can do the same here because it's it's the same bind server only this is working as as an authoritative server we, but we can do uh, the name it uh, ne, ne, sorry name it Check conf, check conf. Okay, we run the name at check conf. You see, we 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 got no no errors. So this should mean that we we've done things well. And now we are going to for the for the server to take the the the, the, the to apply the changes. We are going to reload the server. To reload the server, we can use the same the same uh, system control. Restart bind as we use for the for the resolver. Uh, that should be up and running. And to check it, remember that this system uh, control status bind. Let's see what happens. Okay, bind nine. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right. Something is going on there. Okay, I, I made a mistake here. You see. You see here it says active running, but I have I have some things in red here. So uh, it says that something here is out of range, right? <laughs> you have, I think, one. I don't know. It's... So let me check. Uh, from master file failure. Yeah, you have two more numbers, two two extra digits. Too many, too many numbers. Yeah, yeah, that's too many yeah. numbers. I, I made an error. You, you, you see that? <laughs> you see here. I did the name the check conf and I didn't get error. So semantically, everything is okay. But the serial number I wrote here is out of range. So serial numbers don't go this this far. Serial numbers, I I I, I have two two digits more. Than they, they allow it, so it, it only it only allows for you know these four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten digits. I have twelve digits here, so I have to make the the zero number shorter. Okay, no problem. I edit the sorry, this is not the file. I edit the song file, which is the one that has the the problem. You see, by 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 issuing this this command status, I have a clue of where is the the error. Okay, I go to the to my song file. I have to edit the song file, nano db.group1, that's my song file. And I go to the serial and I'm going to just change the way I, 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 I write this. 
I'm going to put the date and just when I when I put zero one because it's the, the version number one of, of today. So that that way I will I will I will make it uh, keep it to ten digits, which is the allow with the maximum uh, digits allowed for for the for the zone. So if someone edits this again today, we'll change this to two, three, four, five, and and so on. Okay, save it, and then. I will have to restart again the server. So let's do it again. Okay, server restarted. Excellent. And now I'm going to check status. Ta -da! Now it's working. So now it's active <laughs> and no errors. Okay, and see see here. If if we see here, it says all zones loaded. This would mean that here you see our zone is loaded. The server is running. And our 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 zone is always is also sending notifies with this serial number. So if any secondary carries this server, the the answer will be will have this serial number. If the secondary ever see that this serial number changes, so if this for example goes to from one to two at the end, this the the secondaries will. Uh, get rid or erase the, the actual zone and replace it with the new one when they, the new one so they will always have the last version of the of the song okay and uh this means that our our resolver also also fetch the 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 the, the, the dnsx key for the root zone which it, it won't use it because this is a, 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 a only an authoritative server but in case we run a resolver this this is good <laughs> Okay. Okay. So here it says. Yeah. So we can carry Let's try. Uh, ah, yeah. Let me do I something think, I before think for Carlos. This let me do something yeah. before before this. Uh, because we uh, need to wrap up, Nico. Okay. Let's, let's do it. So let's let's check our song. Okay. D. At localhost. Okay. And we have to as we are checking localhost, and we are a resolver, and this has no. Uh, uh, resolver configuration. This is an authoritative server. We'll have to check for our domain. BZ, sorry, group one dot BZ dot T labs dot training, right? Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay, this is actually I, I carry for something that that has yeah it exists but it, it has no 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 resource record a resource record the one that has resource record for example for example is ns1 ns1 one of our exactly. server here okay so here you have remember that our zone uh, this is the configuration of our zone this is one of our of our servers i'm carrying my resolver for this domain to see what's the ip address associated so what the answer i should get is this as the IPv4, 100, 101, 130, and this ending in 130 as the IPv6, right? Here, I let me just do it again so as to be okay. Here, I, I carry for the A record because I put no, no, no option here. It's the A record, the IPv4 associated with this resolver, and I get this, which is okay. And if I ask for the uh, Quad A record for the IPv6 Quad A. associated with my domain. Here I got it. Okay. So my server okay. is basically my authoritative server is basically working. Okay. Awesome. So uh, we have reached the actually we are five minutes past our uh, allocated time. So I would like to invite Kevin to help us with the closing. I'm uh, looking at the chat window on Q and A to see if there is any last questions or comments. While Kevin and I think Etienne get ready to do a short closing. Thank you, Nico. It was extremely interesting. Um, as as we mentioned when before we started the lab, the lab will be um, running until Saturday. Until Saturday, Saturday? yeah, until Saturday midnight uh, Belize time. So you have. The okay. rest of today and all all Friday to 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 go on with all the. Try to repeat on to try to repeat all the all this configuration on your own, and you can you can you know send us an email uh, uh, in case you 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 have any question. Okay. Excellent, Kevin. 
Thank you very much, Carlos. And thank you to, thanks to both Carlos and Nico for conducting this very, very insightful DNS workshop. As they mentioned, the system will be up and running until Saturday, so you can continue to practice in the meantime. Also, all of the sessions are have been recorded and will be available on the event website at a point in time next week. So you can easily review the recordings there in case you have missed something. And if it occurs to you that you have a question or you have something that you like clarification for, feel free to write us at onthemove at lacnic.net. That address is onthemove at lacnic.net. The greatest thanks have to go out to the Belizean community. Without you, this event will not be possible. And we do hope that these activities, okay. the topics that we touched, really have an impact on what you are doing to construct the best Belizean internet experience that you can. But none of this would have been possible without the kind of systems of the Belizean Internet Exchange Point. On that note, I'd like to call on screen Mr. Etienne Sharp, who will give a final round of remarks on behalf of BIXP. Hi, good afternoon. Sorry, guys. I'm also out and about on the move. Um, but I would like to take the opportunity to thank not only LACNIC, but um, specifically people like Kevon, who have ma made sure that he's kept in touch with us throughout these very trying times. And um, Nicholas Carlos, who did a tremendous job today. I'm looking forward to finishing up my lab so, uh, over the next couple of days and, um, and reviewing some of the content. Uh, in fact, Kevon, I will... I will take charge of making sure those links get out to the wider community. So anybody who missed this can still take a take part, maybe watch it over the weekend when they've got a bit more time on their hands. Um, I think that especially DNS and DNSSEC is extremely important in, in every enterprise, as well as especially the IX and the and the, um, the the service providers. So this this specific couple of days has been invaluable, um, giving a, an idea to myself or broadening my my, my ideas of how the CDNs work, um, especially Facebook, it was a certainly an eye opener for me. And um, and then also the, the first set, the first set session we had with respect to gaining resources, because at the end of the day, um, that is what we really need to participate as being part of the internet itself. Um, coming back to DNS and DNSSEC and IPv6, um, one of the reasons why we always ask for those together is because um, IPv6 mm -hmm. obviously more so than than um, than before, um, is totally tied to, to, to DNS and, and DNS sec is a, is a natural progression to make sure that we that we secure DNS. So um, we're looking forward to continuing this and look look, look forward to maybe um, looking at something probably early next year, Kevon, to be able to push forward and see where we are um, with respect to deployments of IPv6 and engaging you guys to see where you can help us. Um, continue that 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 strive to 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 allow smaller networks to be able to feel comfortable and confident with um, with moving forward um, with with our networks. No, so that said, I'd like to thank all the participants. Thank you very much. I know it's trying. Everybody's busy, um, and like me on multiple devices, sometimes trying to keep up. Um, but I'd really like to thank everybody and um, keep your keep logging into the events. Uh, LACNIC always has stuff coming up. I will be posting whenever LACNIC posts for especially the wider community. Um, and please, um, if your organization, um, you feel your organization um, could benefit from having its own resources, by all means, um, go ahead, apply, use the resources. Um, we're always here, here in Belize in the community um, to be able to help and to bridge that gap between um, LACNIC and ourselves. So thank you again. Thank you for everybody for participating and uh, have a great weekend.